What's up? I am David Long. How you doing today? I am here to talk to you about integral theory and I've already made one six minute quick introduction to integral theory, introduced the basic elements, quadrants, levels, lines, states, and types, and kind of talked about overarching general theory, like the fact that we see the map as not the territory, but just a way of talking about these different aspects of reality. And our basic project is to integrate diversity with discernment. So to take all the different perspectives that are online in the world and to put them on the table and to be able to integrate them all in a way that sees them for what they are, that is able to weigh pros and cons and uh, talk about strengths and weaknesses and things like that. A lot of times what happens is people make their own map of reality based on their preferences. I like this, I don't like that kind of a thing. And that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to create a map of the actual reality in a way that takes into account all the perspectives that we have available to us and doesn't try to reduce everything to one thing. So these, these five fundamental things are fundamental elements that people will often try to reduce everything to, but we try to include all of the different aspects, almost like a checklist. Normally, when I teach integral theory like this, I do like to do it kind of one-on-one, -on -one, up close with the map like this. And so this is kind of my simulation of how I would generally like to do it. But I do normally like to cater my lesson on the map to the actual person that I'm talking to. And I find that to be pretty helpful. So today I'm not gonna be able to do that. As I said in my last video, you have these five elements and that's what um, Aqual stands for. It stands for all quadrants, all levels, but it equally connotes all stages, all states, all lines, all types. That's what Aqual is shorthand. So this is an Aqual map. Levels, lines, states, and types are all psychological aspects, whereas the quadrants are more philosophical. So quadrants are probably one of the most complicated aspects of this map. So let's start by just introducing the quadrants. What you have are interiors and exteriors, individuals and groups. So this includes first, second, and third person perspectives. We talk about this in terms of language like I, we, it, and its. So it and its is third person. It is brains and organisms, behavior, objective science, empiricism, behaviorism, physics, biology, neurology, statistics, goals, the facts. That's it. It singular. It's plural is something like uh, systems, social systems, economic, environmental, interobjective systems, chaos theory, political systems, deep ecology, the web of life. So th that's a good example of, of it and its, the objective world that we live in. But then there's interior aspects too, like there's I, so you have self and consciousness and subjectivity, intentions, the contemplative realm, shadow, psychology, spirituality, purpose, values, callings, personal feelings, that kind of thing. And then down here is the relative second person we space. And uh, we implies agreement. So if you and I agree about something, then we say we agree. We feel like we have, we're have we in some kind of a group. And so we also implies values or meaning. And so here you have culture and worldview, meaning, art, music, morality, values, the intersubjective, corporate culture, political values, community values, when we look at philosophy, a lot of our philosophical issues are coming down to how we incorporate or fail to incorporate different quadrants. And a lot of perspectives tend to reduce everything to one quadrant. So up here, you know, you have certain people who reduce everything back to, well, I had the experience, so I know that it's true. And then up here you have people that are like, well, I measured it empirically. And so I know that it's true. 
So you could have empirical reductionists, you could have phenomenological reductionists, you can have relative reductionism, and you can have systems theories reductionist. So there's a reductionism possible to all of these different quadrants. But you can also use these quadrants as a tool for something like decision making. Here's a real practical use, for example. Let's say you're going to go on a trip or you're going to move or something like that, right? So you might want to make a list of all the things that you have to do to get ready to move. You know, you have to get the, your budget in the U-Haul and like get your stuff packed and you have like this big long to-do list, right? So that's one aspect of the things that you have to think about if you're going to move. You also might want to get a hold of the people in your family and the different people who you have relationships with in your life and touch base with them and let all of them know that you're going to move and to some extent reconcile your relationship with them over this move. Maybe it means different things to different people. Maybe you're moving closer to some people and they're going to be excited and you're going to be moving away from other people and they're going to be upset. You can also think about how this fits into the big picture of your life and where it's going and how, you know, moving is going to advance your goals and your bigger picture projects and your idea of yourself and whatnot. And you might also want to dig deep into your own personal feelings and think about all the stuff that it's bringing up in you, you know, your shadow, your fears around moving, whatever it may be. But some people might be really good at doing the to-do list stuff and they might neglect these other quadrants. I think one of the best ways to learn about integral theory is to learn about the different applications of the theory. You can find, for example, integral recovery is a really cool application of the theory, and a lot of what they're working with in regards to the quadrants is a four-quadrant approach to health and reconciliation around issues that might come up as an, as an addict. So, you know, you want, to be, you want to treat the psychological self. You want to actually be making actions in the world to make amends and to do things better, not doing the drugs and doing whatever healthy behavior that you need to do. Maybe going back and healing things with previous relationships and also figuring out how you're going to you know, reintegrate back into society and have a big picture plan. All of those are important factors. How this relates to metaphysics, ontology, epistemology, well, you can uh, check out a video I'll put right here that is about my integral epistemology, and it goes much deeper into depth about different types of truth within each quadrant your subjective truth, your relative truth, your objective truth, and maybe your big picture objective truth as well. Epistemology is like, how do you know? Ontology is like, what is it? And cosmology is like, how did it all get here? And cosmology, there are different ideas. There's idealism and materialism and dualism. And usually, idealism and dualism are kind of on the same team. A lot of integralists will tell you that these quadrants tetra-arise and they go all the way down. So for example, even an atom has some limited form of interiority. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say that the, the quadrants tetra-arise or arise together in sentient holons, or that means in, in living creatures. So all living creatures have all four quadrants. We often talk about the big three because those kind of cover the essentials, but you get a little extra definition on your map if you use its. Now again, we could include she and they and that you know, we could have literally, you know, their, their subjective and objective pronouns. First person subjective is I, objective is me, Plural is we, objective is us. So, you know, so we were talking about earlier about what you want on a map is just how much stuff to make it useful, but not too much to make it clunky. So after sort of looking at all of these things and how they appear in different cultures and what philosophers and scientists have made up out of them, we settle on three or four. And the three are I, we, and it, and the four are I, we, it, and its. 
90% of what you have to do is healthy translation. And a good definition of healthy translation is you give equal emphasis to all four quadrants at whatever level you're at. So you give an equal emphasis to I and to you and to it. And if you give too much emphasis to one, to the I, you're narcissistic at whatever stage. Occupational hazard of males. If you give too much emphasis to you, then you are in a state of fusion. You're lost in the other occupational hazard of females. And if you give too much emphasis to it, then that's sort of a dissociated, not being in touch with interiors at all. This is for describing just left and right now, not Democrat and Republican, because Democrat and Republican have a lot of other things going on in them. But ask somebody where they think human suffering comes from. What's the main cause of human suffering? If you go to, why is somebody poor? You go to a Republican, they'll say, you don't have a work ethic, you don't have family values, you're not working hard enough, you aren't applying yourself hard enough. The problem's with you. Go to a Democrat, go to a leftist, and they'll say, society has not given you the opportunity, society has not given you an education, society has held you down, society is oppressing you. And the real difference between left and right is where they see the cause of human suffering. Does it lie interiorly or does it lie exteriorly? And so I basically believe, of course, that you have to balance both. It's the same when Bill Clinton came out with his welfare bill called um, Responsibility and Opportunity. The responsibility part is your interior part. And that was to make the Republicans happy. And the opportunity part was the government gives you a helping hand. And that's the liberal part. And it was his attempt to blend the left and the right. And all of that fell apart with a cigar, I guess. So what has to be happening in each of the, a person's quadrants in order for them to actually change behavior? What has to be happening in the upper left quadrant in order for someone to change behavior? Openness, love, dissonance, meditation, increased awareness, confusion, choice, being heard. These are all great answers. Let's get into a little bit more specifics and look at the science that's addressed this already. First of all, someone's got to perceive that there's a risk, that there are severe consequences for not changing. There has to be a deep belief that this new behavior is going to address that risk. The person also needs to be able to identify the advantages or benefits of a new behavior and realize that those are going to be greater than the disadvantages of, of the old behavior. They also need to intend to perform the behavior, believe that he or she can perform the behavior, feel that the change is consistent with his or her self-image. This is called egocentonic, where they feel that this is who I am. If I change into this person, this accurately reflects my perspective of who I am in the world. And they need to prioritize the intention to act over all the other intentions that are occurring at the time. So we're inundated with information, desires, ideas. Only 1% of what we're actually thinking, feeling, intending to do actually ends up in behavior. It's probably less than 1%. All these things need to be going on in order to, for, for someone to change behavior. Upper right requirements. Someone obviously needs to have the physical capacity, be developed enough, have the skills and the requisite energy and physical health. And then they need to do it. What about lower left? What are some ideas? What needs to be occurring in the lower left in order for someone to actually change behavior? Support, community, pressure. Yeah, you guys are right on it. They need to understand, there's, there needs to be a mutual understanding. So you have to have a, a language component. They need to perceive the pressure. And if there's a stigma against the old behavior or cultural support for the new behavior, those things are key. And then it helps to identify the new behavior with some sort of social norm. Like everybody recycles here. If you're not recycling, it's, you're out of the social norm. Some lower right requirements. There needs to be a, the systems in place to make it easy. And that can range from economic to social to political systems, dynamics that make it easy to act out the new behavior. If there's not recycling bins in the back of the room, it, it's hard to take care of the compost. Four core principles guide a conscious business or other organization that practices conscious capitalism. These four principles, higher purpose, a stakeholder orientation, conscious leadership, and conscious culture, support entrepreneurs and business leaders to create value for all, building trust and creating healthy, resilient, sustainable businesses. If you take her bottom lines, four bottom lines, that was I, we, and it across the levels. I mean, that literally is an integrally informed prescription. If you use spiral dynamics, that what you're looking for, if you talk about blue, orange, green, and yellow, is principle, profit, person, and planet. And just point out that that really is touching all the bases of quadrants and levels. It's really exquisite. So taking into account all of these styles of spiritual practice, 
both practicing state training, working on your shadow, expressing it in the world, living it, doing your best, and studying more philosophy and digging in further to what other perspectives have to offer. If you fully engage like this, then you are really, really living it. This is what it means to be engaged in, with all four quadrants. That's real healthy translation.